Do you want to start by introducing yourself? Tell us who you are, where you come from. So yeah, my name is Brijlal Choudhury. I'm, I'm a Tharu nation from the foothills of the Himalayas, where the rhinos and the elephants used to roam freely. Uh, now it's in Nepal. <coughs> um, and I grew up in a multi-generational Tharu family. Uh, and I carry the teachings of my, oral teachings of my uh, ancestors of respect, uh, reciprocity, uh, uh, compassion, uh, yeah, indigenous values, you know? Yes, yeah. yes. So you and I talked a lot before we, we came here to speak together, and you had so many interesting references to human rights, but also the effects of your rights have on the ecosystems that you live in. Maybe you can share that with us. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm a Tharu uh, indigenous people's rights activist and I go uh, in spaces like this to talk about uh, indigenous people's rights because, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, all over the world, uh, the, the situation of indigenous peoples is very different than what we know. And before I start again, I just want to uh, remember all those indigenous peoples uh, across the world, the new world that you referred earlier was brought here in Europe in cages and they were toured around. I just want to uh, breathe for them. I just want to think about them. I want to burn a few incense for their spirit because they never returned. <laughs> their family, uh, how to say, kept waited, waited for a long time. Uh, so <laughs> I just want to burn some incense for them and I want to think about them. I, d I don't want to forget them. Uh, and I hope they find some peace. Uh, uh, in, in their spirit or in the realm they are right now. So, but yeah, with terms of uh, uh, environmental and human rights, so uh, Sarah and I talked earlier about um, indigenous peoples and environmental conservation. <laughs> so we talk about like biodiversity, we're ready to accept there are different species around the world that we need to preserve, but indigenous people are guardians of those species, guardians of those ecosystem. We need to respect their rights too, so that the environment that they live in are protected as well. Uh, so uh, we are in a rush now, like you know, where we have uh, we talk about climate anxiety. Uh, people want to change so fast; they want electric cars. <laughs> but do we know uh, what the resources that uh, uh, that that is needed to make electric cars? Lithium, you know, the lithium triangle. People know lithium triangle. Um, Yesterday, a few days ago, I was in a panel. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, how lithium is extracted in Chile, um, and indigenous peoples there, brothers and sisters, are struggling. Uh, and the government tells them, <laughs> "You're violating the constitution of Chile." <laughs> but those brothers and sisters are sovereign nations, uh, and in we talked about uh, Declaration of Human Rights, International Bill of Human Rights. Uh, we have international. Uh, UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, ILO Convention 169, that a lot of Latin American countries have signed. We're not following that, you know? So we're very far behind when it comes to indigenous people's rights and uh, protecting nature. It goes hand in hand. And for any climate discussions, you cannot ignore indigenous peoples. They have to be on the table. When we talk about bi biodiversity, you know, uh, we need to bring indigenous peoples on the table. Uh, and we, ha we need to have an honest conversation, you know, uh, with them because uh, they are the guardians and they have been doing this for a while. And we talked about climate change. They have been doing, they have been adapting they have, uh, with the climate for a really long time. It's not a new thing for them. <laughs> they have lived many disasters. They know when the wind is coming, when the rain is uh, coming. So <laughs> I, I welcome all of you to uh, uh, join indigenous people, invite them with respect uh, and develop uh, good relationships uh, so that together we can create something. And I wanted to share you a story, Sarah. You know, please, <laughs> I, please. I like sharing my grandfather's stories. Um, so one day I was a child and every, we're monsoon people. Our life depends on monsoon rain. If it doesn't happen, um, yeah, <laughs> we do different funny things when the rain doesn't come on time. So, <laughs> so when um, one time the rain was delayed and uh, I asked my grandfather that, 
oh, the rain didn't come. We need to sow the seed, you know. And my grandfather said, I think uh, there is a trouble with the clouds, the mountains, the ocean, uh, the forest. They are not working together. They need to work together so that the monsoon can come uh, in the time that we need. And hence, I, I urge all of us to work together uh, with indigenous people, like the clouds, like the mountains, uh, and the oceans, and the wind, and the sun as well, so that uh, there's a monsoon on time. Uh, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's something I wanted to say about uh, the uh, environment. And one more thing that I want to add is that we're talking about climate change, but um, we need to bring indigenous people's knowledge, their wisdom, their worldviews, their perspective into this conversation. We cannot exclude anymore. I think we have been excluded for a really long time. And uh, uh, we have to bring those uh, conversations uh, 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 back in, in, uh, with indigenous peoples at every single uh, level, including the local to the UN level. Uh, we, cannot <laughs> we cannot deny uh, access to them. And it's a very new thing, Sarah, you know? Like, so I want to share you a story about uh, this chief of six nations in Canada. Um, uh, his name was Chief Des Deskagage. He was a uh, Haudenosaunee. Um, now they have their own passport. <laughs> uh, they are sovereign nations, of course. Uh, in 1923, he went to a League of Nations, you know? He was, he was denied access. Nobody wanted to listen to him. <laughs> now this year is the 75th year that he approached United Nations for the violations of uh, uh, their, their, their right to life, right to culture, um, and right to uh, gather, uh, do a ceremony, and uh, live in their territory peacefully. And I just want to say that if we are working with indigenous peoples, when we're bringing them in, in these climate discussions or the solutions that we're creating, we need to understand how I relate to my mountains, you know? We need to understand how I relate to my rivers. We need to understand how I relate to my land. Otherwise, the solutions that we create is not very long. For, for a Tharu, Tharu person, uh, my mother, she thinks about 15 generations when, he, when she plants the seed. Of course. <laughs> and for, 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 for a profit, uh, uh, and um, I would say, the solutions that we're thinking, we should think like that as well so that it is much more sustainable, and we make, uh, uh, I say, we don't rush. We we look at all those uh, things around us that that might affect the future generations. And uh, uh, another st story that I want to share is uh, we eat a lot of fish from the rivers in Nepal, and even the paddy field, uh, the rice field, um, and. Uh, it's usually my mother who goes to the forest and the rivers um, and men too, but we only take what we need for the day, <laughs> you know? We only take the, the meal that we can uh, eat and the, the, she makes beautiful baskets and she takes the grasses that she needs for one year, not more than that, so that other people can take, you know? So yeah, that's... <laughs> that's yeah, that's ab it. absolutely. All, all of the points you've touched on, but also the discussions that we had mm -hmm previous to the panel, we talked a lot about timing and the essence of time. And, and I think within this summit this year, I think one of the words that I've heard the most is indigenous people or indigenous, indigenous, mm -hmm. indigenous, in different types of panels as I was walking. It's quite interesting, as you mentioned. Um, even last night, we, we had an opportunity for an open mic and I cited the, the speech of Chief Seattle from 1887 and how progressive it was. But we also talked, you and I, about the right to have, to recognize the language of a lot of indigenous people, which is, we talked about this with me, uh, or at least my ancestry or where I come from, where the language is still not recognized, but that's a big thing. To recognize someone's language is also an opportunity for them to share their wisdom. Absolutely, Sarah. <coughs> I just want to share my experience, you know, I'm a Tharu nation and we speak Tharu languages, but uh, Nepal is a diverse country. Uh, it was unified forcefully, uh, but some people say it was a good thing, uh, but it was already a federal state uh, uh, before. Um, and 
I speak Tharu, my mom speaks Tharu, uh, she doesn't speak Nepali, she doesn't, sp my grandfather didn't speak Nepali, he was denied many opportunities because he couldn't speak Nepali, mm -hmm. they couldn't even hire a translator, you know, <laughs> come on. Um, so yeah, like my grandfather sent me to school because he felt ashamed that he couldn't speak a language that was legal uh, or uh, the government used. So he sent me to school and look where I am, you know, I've never been to, I, I lived in Nepal, but I keep moving, you know. I, I, there's a good side at the same time, uh, uh, I'm disconnected from my own territory or my own family, but uh, my mother, she cannot access services, government services, because she cannot speak the language uh, uh, she speaks, the, the services are offered in a uh, different language. So there's a huge pressure for, for us to assimilate, you know, um, and it's, it goes the same thing for all the indigenous brothers and sisters in North America, Turtle Island, where they were sent to, uh, how to say, uh, missionary schools, residential schools, and you can look it up, you know, it wasn't a very pleasant time for, for our brothers and sisters over there. So yeah, it, it creates a lot of, uh, how to say... Uh, of issues, yeah. and, and we talked about it with, even in yesterday's panel on Indigenous Voices, mm -hmm. um, we discussed a lot the importance of the, the language, even with one of the speakers, Zaya, who said that she had to learn to speak Portuguese so that she could basically mm -hmm. represent but there's, a, there's an interesting thing as well, like uh, we discuss it with her as well, that I feel now um, that I have to speak the language myself, otherwise it would be lost, or at least I won't be able to tra transmit it to my daughter, who's in the audience, by the way, <laughs> hi. Yeah, uh, um, you, you, you bring and, a And you lose that, yeah. but in, in, the, in the same sentence, it's, it's like there has been um, a sense of ambassadorship or diplomacy where we have to represent the people that have come before us, and we have to do it with their languages, otherwise there's something that's lost. But it's such a task when you're still moving in a in an arena where there's still no recognition for for that. And if we have to do it in another language, then I guess you're doing it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why my grandfather sent me to school, and I was the only one who left my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then. Uh, I did, I was really assimilated into Nepali, uh, uh, Nepali uh, system and uh, I have a friend here, <laughs> I told her I was Nepali when I was uh, in high school, uh, but when I had my kid, you know, you mentioned the, your child, that's the moment I felt like, you know, oh my God, all this, all this uh, knowledge and all this like uh, blood memory that I have is sitting in my subconscious and I'm not using it. And if I don't use it, if I don't teach my uh, two, I have two daughters, and I speak to them in my mother tongue, if I don't teach them, then uh, I will never, <laughs> you know, like my grandfathers will never live, you know? I want, I want them to live. I want my grandmother, my ancestor to live. That's through, beautiful. Through our blood, through our memory, through our dreams. And they are not gone anywhere. They are st still with us, you know, through us. And nobody's can, nobody can take them away from, from us, you know? So, yeah, so th uh, that's the moment I, I, I started doing my activi activism work in terms of uh, being indigenous and reclaiming my identity and, uh, how to say, sharing the stories uh, that I, my experiences and um, the world that we're trying to create together. Um, and again, I want to share a story about the healthy forest, you know. Uh, uh, so the Tharu land is very close to the tr uh, subtropical rainforest uh, in the southern foothills of Nepal. And it's, it's a, my grandfather and I went, ventured a lot together. <laughs> he was my fa best friend. Uh, and uh, he showed me uh, all the forests and all the plants and all those livings, you know, that was in the forest. And he told me that, uh, look at the forest, you know, it has space for everybody. Uh, everything grows here. And for a healthy forest, we need very diverse, uh, how to say, plants <laughs> uh, and bushes and trees and everybody has a space there. Nobody is being uprooted, and nobody should be uprooted, <laughs> because uh, my brother, Jeddah, <laughs> Mama Jeddah, you know, everybody has a space in this world. Um, and we talked about uh, two-spirited people in Canada, Turtle Island. We, we, we celebrated when somebody uh, declared them as, them as uh, two-spirited. There was a celebration in family, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, so I, th I think what you what you're telling with all your stories, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something that I've I've assimilated as, you know, the expression being a force of nature, mm -hmm. 
and the power that comes with that, which feels that, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how the divide of the human power over nature, that they feel that they're superior, but really when you look at the force of nature, you talked about earthquake, Jude, and how if an earthquake happened, it's against, the, you know, it's because of the gaze, and trying to, to leverage in some way the power of humans and the power of nature. But I feel like indigenous people and anyone, indigenous or not, when we embody the, the power of nature and its rightful position into our universe, we become invincible. And I think that's what you're trying to tell with your stories. And I think it's very interesting because we know now that we, we all know now, and I think that's what has been discussed a lot during the summit, is that if we want to we take the step forward, which actually has been documented in a lot of indigenous um, scriptures, like, can I use that word? <laughs> a lot of indigenous scriptures, including the Mayans, I know there's a few Mexicans in the room, um, in the Mayan scriptures, we know that we, are, we would come into this time of a crossroad that a lot of indigenous descendants would feel called to express what their ancestors had tried to address, and that we would have to make a choice. And I think this is the right moment to discuss about the rights of humans, but also the rights of nature and how they are intrinsically connected and how you cannot separate them. But true storytelling is the most beautiful way to do it. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, nobody is above nature, you know. Uh, uh, nat the law of nature is indigenous people's nature uh, law. That's our that's our law. We follow the law of nature. Absolutely. And uh, uh, and that's more. That's what I was trying to say. You said it better than me. But the law of nature is much more powerful than awesome, any yes. type yeah. of yeah. universal declaration yeah. of yeah. rights. Yeah, it just goes beyond yeah. um, beyond anything that we. And, and what I thought was interesting in the previous panels that we've done is that we wanted to include, on the first one, we wanted to include different voices of different... So we had a, a person living with a disability and, and their stories were incredible and just as heartbreaking as yours, Jide. Um, and we had so many different things and we were like, but we should also talk about... We, if we could have animals on stage mm. to speak about their rights. And, and, and of course, I mean, we could have trees. <laughs> we could have just all the elements are connected to the rights of being human. Mm -hmm. They are intrinsically connected. And the moment you try to separate them by just creating a structured um, definition of what human rights are, which we do need, mm -hmm. um, but I think we need, and that's actually was the title of the first panel that we did in 2021, and we had Nemonten and Kimo, uh, who spoke then, um, about nine months pregnant, barefoot in the Amazon, <laughs> uh, through video. But it was very interesting to hear her speak about, you know, like that our connection to human rights are connected to nature at all times and, and all times in history. Yeah, uh, and uh, this year, I don't know if you know United Nations Permanent Forum of, on Indigenous Issues in New York uh, this May, they talked about planetary health and indigenous people's rights and health. So our health, like when we talk about health, it's just not our physical health. We have our mental health, our spiritual health, mm -hmm. our uh, planetary health. That's all connected to, to indigenous people's health. So health is like a very broad thing for us, you know? And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bigger force uh, that shows that we're just a very small part of uh, this ecosystem that we live in, you know, that needs uh, uh, and we are nothing compared to uh, the system that exists around us. And you talked about uh, rights a little bit. I just want to uh, take uh, uh, this discussion about uh, the human rights. So the idea of human rights is very individual. That's when the two world clashes. Indigenous people's rights are, uh, how to say, uh, customary, uh, 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 collective rights. So there is a land, uh, and people have been using it for a really long time, indigenous people. and. Uh, nobody has legal legal title in it. Uh, that means the government can take, the miners can take as well. So that's where uh, the the member states, the governments, uh, the businesses, how to say it, have difficulty understanding when it comes to uh, our collective rights, which is uh, very difficult for a lot of organizations organizations to understand. And uh, because of that. Uh, uh, 
uh, we face a lot of problems, uh, especially like when uh, the government takes the land, gives it to the tourism sector, <laughs> gives it gives it to mining uh, industries. So this is these are the things that uh, the businesses, <laughs> governments, uh, the whole world should understand. And indigenous peoples would like to work with uh, people all over the world to to talk on these issues and. Uh, in Geneva, they talk about uh, there is a lot of guiding principles that have been uh, there, you know, and people like us, they are way forward than our member states or the leadership. Um, there's a lot of kindness uh, that have uh, felt uh, to the places that I've been uh, uh, and claiming my indigeneity and have, 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 have had very kind responses, you know, but it's just the leadership uh, in, in, in our countries that uh, is a big challenge. They, they have hard time understanding um, the systems that we lived, uh, the governance system that we have had before the states was created. So all the structures that we have uh, developed is without indigenous peoples. And we need to redesign UN, uh, member states, France or Nepal or Brazil, you know, uh, with, indigenous uh, uh, with indigenous people, because those structures are not for indigenous peoples. It, it ignores the worldviews of indigenous people, um, and it ignores uh, indigenous children to create that world and live in that world that their ancestors have lived. So it's very n the spaces are becoming very narrow, um, and that yeah, it has many consequences, you know. Uh, that crossroad we spoke about. Yeah, yeah. In closing, I really would like, if you can, mm -hmm. to share a few words in your mm -hmm. indigenous language. And tell us what they mean. <laughs> you have the floor. Hamar nam Brizlal Taudariya. Ham ham hamar ghar nichuta ha. Hamar mai ke nam jan ke dili tharuni ha. So I I just said my name is Brizlal Taudari. I'm from a very small village called uh, Nichuta, and uh, I'm I I really uh, I'm very grateful to my mother, and her name is Janki. Uh, she's a single mother and raised four kids, you know, uh, and she's happy that I'm not with her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, she's, she's, she's proud that I go and talk about uh, her stories, our ancestors' stories. Um, yeah, and I miss her. <laughs> oh, I miss her. My, my, I miss mine too. And my mom is Minana, and she's very happy that I'm talking about indigenous voices too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, namaste. <laughs>